Welcome to the Money GPS. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Inflation is going to get a smack. At least that's what we're being told. The first thing I want to cover today is the recession that is incoming, at least according to the data. The second thing connects in directly with that and is the most accurate signal, what it's saying right now and what this could mean over the next couple months. And the third thing is the financial markets and how they've been responding to all this information information you know don't fight the fed they say well let's get into all that and more here we have it i just wanted to mention this every single article i find this term i wanted to bring it to you and that is demand destruction what are we talking about here if you've got inflation there's one thing that can bring that down naturally and that is a recession demand destruction. If suddenly consumers aren't out there buying stuff, if there isn't a demand for whatever that product or service is, that starts to bring the pressure down. So how do you in fact get rid of inflation? Well, you create a recession. So let's see what happens over the next little while. But every time I see that and every time you see that, we need to point it out. So make sure you keep an eye out for demand destruction. The Fed has made a U.S. recession inevitable. Wait a second. Is this the money GPS headline? Is it something from a random analyst on Bloomberg? Or could it be, in fact, a former, what was he, the Fed, what was he, the Fed governor? Let's see. U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has made two ambitious assertions about the central bank's management of the economy in his latest news conference. He said that the Fed's new, more inflation-tolerant monetary policy framework bears no responsibility for the recent sharp surge in consumer prices. Then, the following week, he cited three historical examples – tightening of 64, 84, and 93 as evidence that the Fed can achieve a soft landing, slowing growth, and curbing inflation without precipitating a recession. Bill Dudley, that's right, he says that in fact a recession is going to happen. And it's funny because when you get these governors, I believe he was the governor, Bill Dudley, when you see the former, like, for instance, when Greenspan left as Fed chair, he had a lot of good information to share. But during that period of time, during his tenure, you know, you know, he, he wasn't going to obviously say all the truths. And now we start to see that again and again. This happens to be uh, just one more example. I disagree with both. The Fed's application of its framework has left it behind the curve in controlling inflation. This, in turn, has made a hard landing virtually inevitable. You can read this if you want. Basically, what happened back with Jerome Powell in uh, you know, the statement that they made, and then, of course, the conference that was after, basically what he was suggesting is that we had no idea that we could predict what would occur. We thought inflation would be transitory, and yet here we are today. As a result, we need to increase interest rates. Funny thing, I saw people all over the place, all, like literally all over the place, whether that is the alternative media, uh, you know, different YouTube channels. I saw this come in, um, you know, in the financial, regular financial media, and of course, for the Federal Reserve, the governments and so on. We were going to get some inflation, it was going to peak out, and then it was going to come back down. It would only be a few months after the summertime that would go away. That didn't happen. And then we had this whole nonsense about, you know, the Federal Reserve, they can't increase interest rates, and they won't. Well, not not only are we here at the point of which they have already increased interest rates, mind you, all of those individuals out there, the YouTube channels and so on, that were telling you constantly they're not going to increase, they're not going to increase, they're not, they've already done that and there should be some words for those people to say, hey, do you want to walk back what you said? Anyway, but now we are entering a time in which the markets have gone up considerably from their bottom. And we'll talk about that in part three. Stay tuned and don't forget to hit that thumbs up. Look, we are now entering a point in which the markets are going up. Doesn't that give the Federal Reserve more ammunition and more reason to then increase interest rates? Hey, nobody's going to be mad if we now increase them. If the market was down significantly, we're in a bear market, you know, they could say, well, you know, maybe we won't do it too hard. But now markets are going up, you know, when's the next all-time high? 
could happen soon, right? You've got all of those high flying stocks happening right now, GameStop and AMC and anything you could, you know, throw some cash at that's happening today. So don't you think that's a bit of a concern for all those people who are saying, don't worry, don't fight the Fed. Well, if we're not going to fight the Fed, then the Federal Reserve is tightening. So what does that mean? Hmm. Okay. Eight out of nine. That's the Fed's record on triggering a recession while trying to fix inflation. Let me tell you, every single time it happens, they do the exact same thing. They are always too late. They are always doing it on purpose. Oops, I said it. I said it. You can mention, you know, it's because of, oh, it's the politicians. They want, you know, they put the pressure and this and that. It's got nothing to do with that. Come on. Come on. Balance sheets of the Fed and the S&P 500. Look at what happens every single time. I note this over and over and over again. And you can see in this red box what happened. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet flatlined during this period, 2015, okay? And then you go on into 2017. And now you might think to yourself, well, markets didn't really come down. I mean, there was this little dip in this period here. But what happened right here? Of course, you had multiple central banks, including the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England, if I'm not mistaken, uh, possibly the ECB as well, they increased their balance sheets during that period. Oh, well, then that's a different story, right? So we had this coming up. Now, of course, you have a problem, a big problem, is that what happens when they turn that around? Hmm. You have a concern. Okay, so these are the others. You know, you look at QE1 and QE2 and you see what happens over the period. It's not direct. If, you know, I see people all the time trying to say, well, look on that day, it didn't go up. No, no, it's not like that. It's a generalization. If they are easy with their policies, markets go up. If they are tight with their policies, well, then we have to rely on other things. What are those other things? Well, you stayed this far into the video. It's about seven minutes in. We've got stock buybacks near a record high. So that is the biggest buyer of stocks. And of course, that could help the markets. If corporate profits do very well, another thing that could help the markets as well. I think I'll be getting to that more in uh, a later part of the video. Let's go on. Central bank holdings of government bonds and percentage of total issuance, USA, Eurozone, and Japan, they're all up. Okay, but I'm just want to trying to show you here that all around the world, they have expanded further and further. This is the M2 money stock. Of course, the amount of money, cash that's out there, 24-month percentage change. It's just looking over a two-year period, how much money has been pumped into the system. And going back from the 80s up until the present, we've never seen anything like this before. I like looking at this particular indicator like in different ways. This is over a two-year period. Uh, and, and it just shows you. It's pretty clear. Central bank balance sheet assets, Bank of Japan, Fed, ECB, all have as a percentage of the GDP as well, just showing you they've gone up like crazy. And then we have this um, hilarious, this is the Fed Bank of San Francisco. <laughs> they actually, <laughs> oh my goodness, keep it together, GPS. It's the moments like this that I wait for, okay? It really is. Okay, why is US inflation higher than in other countries. Well, according to the Federal Reserve, you could read it for yourself, but I'll just tell you the, the long and short of it. Oh, you remember the, all that money that was pumped out there through the stimulus programs in 2020 and 2021? Yeah, that might have had an impact on inflation. The Federal Reserve saying it themselves. You heard it here first, my friends. All right. Now, let's look at the chart GPS really quickly. I want to move through this section just to show you what's been happening. If you see time and time again, the most important signal or the most accurate signal or whatever you want to call it, the yield curve inversion. This is it looking at it all, you know, all across the spectrum going back from 1990s up until the present. Every single time it signals a recession come in. You look at this, this is the two in the 10 year. That's the big one. Okay, then we have the two and the 30, same situation. 
And this one right here is something else we'll talk about in just a second. I just wanted to show you for those who are unaware of what this is, yield curve inversion really quickly. I know some of you know already. Basically, imagine you got a 30 year bond. If you're taking a 30 year bond, you want to be able to be compensated quite a bit because that's a 30 year length term, right? Who knows what's going to happen in 30 years? So they would give you a better return than let's say a one year bond. But what would happen if you actually got more for the one year than the 30 year? I mean, things are really messed up. That's the yield curve inversion that's taking place today. This right here is the Taylor rule. And basically what it's trying to, like sort of the oversimplified version is, where do we got to be to get back to neutral? Okay, the Fed funds rate right now is, uh, you know, basically right at the, near the bottom anyway. You could look at that as, the, as a little black line. There's kind of that little, little bit of a dot that has come up. Um, but essentially... We have to increase interest rates by over 11% just to get it back up to where it was. I mean, no, not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it's just not going to happen. All right? Not going to happen. We know that. We know that. But in the meantime, we could have some fun with this, okay? And then I want to show you something really quickly right here. Right now, the markets. What's happening? Well, if I show you as I record this video, uh, looking at oil at about $105 a barrel, you know, the whole issue with, with Ukraine and, and Russia, markets have completely brushed that off. Let's see if I got these loaded up in here. Look at the market, how it has come off the lows considerably. This is the QQQ represented by the NASDAQ, uh, you know, I should say the NASDAQ represented by QQQ, and it has come all the way up just blowing past everything. And of course, we are looking a little bit overbought uh, to some degree in, in the short term anyway. But I just want to show you that really quickly. And then that the, you know, the data shows us that this is the largest 10-day S&P 500 gain of 2022, ranking in the 98th percentile of bear market rallies. I don't necessarily think that, you know, we wouldn't want to call that a, what that was was a bear market at all, uh, unless we're talking about you know zooming out and, and seeing where we are. Uh, that that's a whole different story. Essentially, the markets have moved up real fast. That's all. The equity rally has also surpassed the largest ten-day returns in seven of the S and P's eleven bear markets since 1927. Was and was actually larger than any of those bear market rallies when controlling for the size of the prevailing max drawdown. Okay, more stuff just showing you markets have come up. Um, here we have the tighter Fed, higher inflation expectations, and an inverted yield curve had followed Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that's, of course, affecting the bond market considerably. The bond market is sending off big, big signals, okay? And that's more of that. And then we have the move index, a rise in rates, vol, the, in the move index. That's basically you know, your volatility in the bond market versus falling equity vol measured in the VIX, that's the stock market, the volatility of the stock market, has been the largest since 2009 and one of the largest ever. So there's a great divide in between the two. It's the largest increase in rates vol versus falling equity vol since a global financial crisis. So ultimately, we've got a big concern today. And that, my friends, is in fact an issue. Now you stay to the end. And I want to tell you something. I want to tell everybody out there, not just the millennials who love their avocado toast, but avocado prices surged to a 24-year high. Don't you dare get in the way of me and my avocados. All right? That guacamole is getting more expensive. And we got to, what are we going to do? Okay, what are we going to do? Any of my friends in Mexico, you got to send me some avocados. Come on. All right, this is unbelievable. Just trying to have a little fun with it. But it is um, it is extreme, to say the least. Okay, I had so much more to cover, but that's the way it is um, every day. Too much information, right? Look, you want to support the channel? Hit that thumbs up button. Um, you know, I wanted to cover this. Uh, real investment advice, corporate buybacks, global inflows into the U.S., remaining strong, corporate profit, oh, not even showing you what's on my screen, 
Corporate profits remain robust, remain robust. Inflation while high will decline, decline later this year, giving a boost to disinflationary trades. We will see if that's all accurate. That was coming from Real Investment Advice. Uh, but anyway, what I wanted to just note here is that people need to be aware of where the money is today. They need to watch out. They need to hedge their bets. They need to start to go a little bit risk off right now. If you've got invested in those triple leverage kind of ETFs, you know, not here to tell you what to do, but taking extreme risk, not, not the best uh, idea at this time. Uh, I'm in the middle of an audiobook right now called Red Notice. If you haven't uh, read that one before, it was recommended me uh, to me by somebody in the financial industry that I, I trust. Uh, interesting stuff about uh, Russia, about uh, Poland, about a bunch of different things. So um, very interesting stuff. I'll bring more to you. Uh, you know, that's it. See you on the next one. Take care.